This morning I want to share a message that again goes along with a lot of what we've been sharing and I just I really ask you to, to be reminded and, and to be be aware again that we feel strongly that Jesus is our high priest is in the atonement robes that John seen in the book of Revelation. He's standing at the heavenly temple. He's in front of the menorah, the candlesticks. He is working at trimming. He is working at refreshing and refilling his church, his people. He is sending a message to the churches to get ready to be prepared. So many things that we see on the horizon that is necessary and that is happening. And so... Um, this morning I want to start in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Where there is no vision, now I'm going to do the best I can not to get excited. I'm going to do the best I can not to get loud. I'm not going to try to throw my hands in the air. I'm going to try not to talk with my hands. And I've already noticed that I have started doing that. So I'm going to put them down here and eventually put them in my pocket to try to control them. My hands are just out of control, very, very rebellious. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. The word unrestrained we're going to look at in a moment, but it really just, just quickly means no standard, no guidelines. They throw off their love for God. In other words, they stop laying down their concern, their compassion, their care for others. Happy is he who keeps the law. And this word law at this point, or excuse me, the word keep means 8104, and it's S-H-A-M-A-R, and it means guards or protects or observes. So happy is the one who guards and protects and observes the law. The law, all of the prophets, and all of the law is summed up in two commands, people. So catch what he's saying. Happy is he who guards and protects and observes the law that is summed up in two commands found in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That encompasses the entire law right there. And God is saying, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But happy is he who guards, protects, or observes the law of love. Vision. It is the Old Testament 2377, and it means kazon. It comes from the Old Testament 2372, which means a mental sight. A dream, a vision, or to be able to, in essence, have a revelation or an oracle of God. And the word unrestraint, in the King James uses the word perish, comes from the Old Testament 6544, P-A-R-A, and it means to dismiss, to uncover. Or in other words, to throw off all of the restraints and become careless in your behavior with no concern about how it may affect someone else. Can I say that? It means to, in other words, throw off all of the restraints and become careless in your behavior. And God said, when you don't have the vision... When you don't have the revelation of God, the understanding of who God is, then you will not worry or care about your behavior, and unfortunately, you will then not care about whether it affects someone else or not. On Wednesday night, we started looking now at the seven churches, and the first church is the church at Ephesus. And we mentioned to them a process that started way back at the church of Ephesus, Ephesus and it's, I term it the whittling process. Have any of you ever watched someone take a piece of wood and a knife and start whittling? I don't know if you've noticed, but they don't really cut off great big pieces at a time. They just do a little at a time. 
when they're whittling to make whatever they want to make and begin to fashion it and form it. And you may not realize how the enemy works, but he uses the whittling process. You are the wood, the church is the wood that he is using to whittle on. And the whittle process means that it is slowly cutting away. Now listen to me, please. Slowly cutting away the essentials that makes the church a church or an individual Christ-like until there is nothing left rather than just simply a form of godliness or a godless form of someone that's just pretending and denying the power of God. Did you catch that? He whittles away the essentials. What is one of the essentials? To keep the law. What is the law? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This whittling started way back at the church of Ephesus when it said you've left your first love. People catch this. They were a very powerful church. They they were very active. They were doctrinally sound and right on. They checked false prophets and were able to detect them and knew who they were, but they were doing it out of a duty rather than out of a love. And it said they left. They drifted or it was whittled away from them a little at a time. And unfortunately, when we get down to the church at Laodicea, seven churches later, we find out that that first aspect of losing their love was never corrected. Amen? And it just whittled away more and more and more of the truth of God's Word to where when it gets down to Laodicea, they're more concerned about themselves and their rights than they are about other people or about what God longs and desires. So when you begin to see what God is trying to do and trying to share and the message He's trying to give to His people, we can begin to understand in our heart God is wanting us to come back to loving Him more than anything else and loving our neighbor as ourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31. Whether then you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I please all men in all things, I'm not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Can I go back here for a moment and want you to look at verse 31 and look at the word glory. No matter what you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, Or whatever you do, do it all to the glory. That word glory in the Greek is 1391 in the New Testament Strong's. And it's D-O-R-A. It means dignity. It means honor. And it means resulting in praise. Or in other words, it means to please, to obtain a good opinion. Now, I want to explain something. We know that when we do this, we are to be doing it so that God would receive glory or honor, that we would be giving dignity to the name of God, or that we would be giving praise to God through our actions. But did you also know that it means, now catch this, it means that God then would in turn give you praise, honor, and dignity. It means that God would look at you and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So now let me go back and reread this in McConnell's unauthorized translation. And if you are a visitor, my last name is McConnell, so that unauthorized translation is my translation. Don't go to the bookstore and try to find a Bible that's underneath the McConnell translation. Okay? Let me read that. So no matter what you do, whether you're eating or whether you're drinking, 
no matter whatever it is, when you do it, do it so that God will receive honor and dignity and he will receive praise, but then will in turn give you praise and his opinion of you will be that you have pleased him and he will say well done for the way that you have reacted. And then look at verse 32. Give no offense. It's interesting that when you and I think about the word give, it would be like me taking this pencil, handing it to Jared, and then saying, he gave that pencil to Jared, or Jared, I'm going to give it to you, transferring from me to you. But when you go into the Greek and you begin to look at that particular word, it comes from 1096, the New Testament strong 1096, G-I-N-O-M-A-I, and it means to become, to begin to, or to come into existence. And the word offense is 677, and it means cause to stumble. So now let's look at it in McConnell's Unauthorized, which says... Do not become a reason or do not become a way that someone stumbles, neither to the Jews, to the Greeks, or to the church of God. That puts quite a responsibility on our shoulders, doesn't it? That whatever I do, I am to be doing it so that I can please God and I will give Him honor. He will praise and say, well done, but I'm doing it so that I will not become a stumbling block to my brother or my sister and people that is fulfilling the law. To love my neighbor as myself. When we walk down through and begin to realize that Paul says, therefore imitate me as I imitate Christ, we need to begin to understand that the main objective of your life, the main purpose of the church, which the enemy has whittled away to make the church not be the church. He's whittled away to stop us. What has he whittled away? Our love, our compassion, our care that we're not concerned whether it offends somebody or hurts somebody. We don't care if we're putting stumbling blocks in somebody's way as long as it's within our freedom. Please hear what God is wanting us to understand and to grasp. The main objective of your life, the main objective of a believer's life is to please God and to walk as Jesus walked, promoting God's glory, God's honor, and then in turn receiving God's praise. You remember what he said about Christ? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus received the praise. He received the honor as well as giving the honor and the glory. You and I are to follow the example of Christ. And allow the same spirit, the same attitude that Christ had to be in us. In other words, we are to be Christ-like. That's what it means to be a Christian. To be like Christ. First and foremost, in Christ was his love for God the Father and his love for others. That's the law. That's the standard that God has set. People, please listen. The believer, our love. Now, I want you to hear this. I was in here praying, and I had what I felt God dropped this into my heart. And when he dropped this into my heart and my spirit, I laid here on my face and I began to weep and I began to cry because I realized that I haven't always pleased God. Listen, your love, my love for God will be the motivation that will direct our love, my love for others. Did you hear that? Do you realize that if you don't care what somebody else thinks, 
you don't care whether you offend them or not, that is in direct proportion to your true love for God. That's hard. Our love for God is shown by our laying down our lives and our wants for others. Our love for God is not just studying the Word and filling our mind and our spirit with knowledge of what we have and what we don't have. Our love for God is going to be in direct proportion to your obedience to God's Word and laying down your life and walking as Jesus walked. And His love for God was foremost. 1 John chapter 4 Verse 20 and 21, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, how do we hate? One of the major ways that we truly hate people or hate our brother is when our liberty and our freedom is more important to us than their salvation. Think about that for a moment. It says that if someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. That word liar is in the New Testament 5583, and I I couldn't pronounce it. It'd be P-S-E-U-S-T-E-S, and it means one who breaks faith, one who is faithless, one who is false. So he says, if someone says that he loves God and yet hates his brother, He is an individual who has broken faith, who has actually become faithless. And he does not love his brother. How can he love God whom he has not seen and then yet turn around and hate his brother whom he has seen who is part of the body, part of Christ? Christ died as much for him as he did for me. And this command we have from Christ, that the one who loves God should also love his brother. The second thing about Christ-like, Christ's love for God was always first and foremost. It was always above his own wants, his own desires, his own life, his own freedom. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2, Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who did not think equality with God was something that needed to be grasped, but rather set that equality aside, emptied himself of self, took on the obedient servant even to the form of death, physical death as well as death to self. His love for God. He emptied himself. He didn't feel the equality was something that he had to grasp. But yet, you and I, if we're not careful, please hear me. Think about the whittling process and how the enemy tries to whittle the very essentials out of our life that is necessary. And Paul tells us himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 that if we get too much knowledge, that knowledge will puff us up and we'll become prideful and arrogant and think because we have all of this knowledge that we're okay. But he goes on in chapter 13 and says you can have all of the knowledge in the world, but if you don't have love, it's worthless. It's all about the command of loving God and loving one another with all of our heart and our soul. If we're not careful and he whittles away, we will begin to feel because of our knowledge of who we are in Christ, we can begin to become arrogant and prideful and believe that our liberty for self is more important than our desire to set things aside, to reach and minister to the other individual. And that will reflect upon our love for God. Number three, Christ's love for the Father was revealed in his concern for God's honor and God's respect. You remember what Paul says in Corinthians 10? He says, no matter what you're doing, make sure you're doing it so it'll honor God. It'll glorify God. It'll honor God. It'll please God. That you're trying to please God. And Christ's love for the Father was revealed in his concern that everything he did in laying down his life was for God's honor and God's respect. 
He showed his love to the Father, being faithful steward, laying down his life for those that were around him, those that had been given into his care. Listen. I know I say listen a lot. It's my pet word. So please, listen. I want you to look around. Please, I want you to look around. I want you to point out to me somebody in here that's got a weak conscience and somebody that's got a strong conscience. You can't do it, can you? See, you don't know who you might offend and who you may not offend. So if you're going to love, you're going to be careful. Amen? But here's the thing I want you to say, or I want you to know. As you look around, everybody in here has been given to you by God for you to be the steward of that person. God has placed everybody here together this morning for myself and Pastor Steve and the Sunday School teacher and each one of you to be their steward, to love them, to care about them, to be concerned about them. And this is what Jesus is trying to refer to many times in the parables. When you start looking at the parables, he says the same thing over and over and over in so many different ways, bringing different illustrations so that he can hopefully get your attention. If he can't get it in one way, hopefully he'll get it in a different way. And as we look at Matthew chapter 24, and we look at verse 45 through 50, who then is the faithful and sensible steward or slave? That's talking about us. Are we faithful before the Lord? And what was the word liar? The word liar was to break faith to be faithless. And so he says, who is the faithful and the sensible steward whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Did you know that each one of you have been given a responsibility with your brothers and sisters and with your household? Did you know you've been given the responsibility to lay down your life to make sure that they're being fed with the proper food and seeing the proper attitude and the proper way to live? You know the way we feed one another is our lifestyles as much as what we say is going to be our actions and how we respond in so many different ways. Blessed is that steward or that servant when his master comes, finds him doing so. And verse 47, truly I say that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But here I want to take a little bit of time on verse uh, 48. Now you remember you said we weren't on a schedule, right? I heard that earlier. When Pastor Steve asked you if you were on a schedule, I heard everybody say, no. <laughs> Remember that, okay? I want to look at verse 48. But if the evil ser ser servant, if that evil steward says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and he begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with the drunkards. I have said many times that our English language in so many ways does us injustice. In the English language, there is one word for love. In the Greek, there are four. And each one of them means a little different capacity. In the English language, the word sin, as you have seen, we have one word, it's sin. The last couple of weeks, we looked at the six different words in Hebrew, and each one of them have a different connotation. As we look at these words here, the word evil, to us, the word evil means one thing, but it, yet it has two different connotations and two different words. The word in verse 48 is totally different than the word evil in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that we're going to look at in just a moment. But here, the word evil in verse 48 is uh, the New Testament Strong's 2556, K-A-K-A-O-S, and it has to do with character. It has to do with your nature. So what it says, but if the servant has a bad character or if he has a bad nature and then allows in his heart to say, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat. Now you and I always would think the word beat means we take a stick and we hit somebody, we double up our fist 
and we hit somebody and we spank them or whatever. We're beating them. And that is a meaning of the word beat. But I really want you to catch this, please. Because here in the New Testament Greek, the word 5180-T-U-P-T-O not only means strike, but it also means, now listen, it means to wound or to disquiet one's conscience, to offend. Now let's go back and look at this in McConnell's Unauthorized. But if a steward that has bad character or a bad nature says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and he begins to wound and disquiet one's conscience and offend his fellow slaves and eat and drink with the drunkards, I want you to notice the activity that they're involved with. I also want you to know that it said in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man where there will be eating and drinking and marrying, giving and marrying. They're not concerned about one another. They don't care about anybody but themselves. And God is getting a message to His church, to His people that said we got to get back to being what God intended, and that is a Christian is to be Christ-like. Amen? But when you begin to realize in verse 48 refers to someone who has lost or does not have the vision, the revelation, the mental insight to the reality that Jesus is coming and coming soon. They've lost sight of that reality and they have become self-absorbed and they've thrown off the restraints. They've put all caution to the wind and they have become careless in their behavior and in their companionships, having no concern about others and how it would appear to them or if it would disquiet or wound their younger or weaker brother and sister's conscience or if it would cause them to stumble. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 through 22, but examine everything. Now remember, he said, no matter what you do, whether you eat or drink, here he says, examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. But then verse 22, abstain. Keep away from every form or appearance of evil. Here, the word evil is totally different than the one we find up in Matthew chapter 24, verse 48, where it talks about a bad character or a bad nature. The word evil here is a different word altogether, and it means, uh, it, it's number 4190, excuse me, and it means hurtful or influential behavior or influential actions. So again, may I read this in McConnell's Unauthorized Translation? But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good, but stay away from every action or every appearance that would be hurtful or influential in your behavior in a bad way. And then notice what else is said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 50 through 51. The master of that servant, that evil, that bad nature, corrupt moral nature that is thrown off the restraints he will come on a day when he does not expect it at an hour which he does not know and he will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. First of all, I want you to go back and notice in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 48 what he uh, uh, relates that eating and drinking with no concern. He relates it to the drunkards. Now take and look what he has come on down in verse 51 and who he relates them to. He relates it to the hypocrites, to the pretenders. 
He said, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And since he doesn't have any mental insight, does he has no revelation, no oracle, no awareness of God, he isn't going to be ready. He's not going to be prepared. He's not going to have trimmed his wick. He's not going to have put on the robe, spotless robe of righteousness. He is not going to have his oil refreshed. He is going to allow his behavior to be careless. And as a result, he will be classified as a hypocrite. Matthew chapter 24, verse 51 in the Amplified says, And he will be punished. He will be cut up. He will be cut up and scourged. He will be thrashed as if threshing the wheat, and he will put him with the pretenders, where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Where there is weeping and grinding and gnashing of teeth. And according to Jesus, that, as we have looked at in the past, is the outer darkness. Matthew chapter 8, please stay with me for a little longer. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 12. But the children of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness where there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. The wailing and the weeping and the gnashing is because of the pain, because of the thrashing, because of the punishment, because of the suffering they're going through because they have missed when the master came and they were not ready and did not go in and the door was shut. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 30. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness in the place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And as we've already seen, and I don't want to reiterate it, but remember Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, tell us where that great darkness and that gloom is. It's the day of wrath. It's the day of tribulation. It's the day when God begins to atone for the sins of the world. But go on with me to Luke 13, if you would quickly, please. Luke 13, verse 24 through 28. Strive to enter through the narrow door, through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, many will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house, once the master comes, gets up and shuts the door, if you are not ready, if you are not acting, behaving properly, if you are not concerned and loving God with all of your heart and your soul, he'll shut the door and he says, you will be left out even though you stand and knock on the door saying, Lord, open to us. He will answer and say, I did not know where you are from. And you will begin to say, Lord, we ate and we drank in your presence and we taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evil doers. Go back to Matthew 24, 48, where he talks about the evil, the bad character, the bad nature that's thrown off the restraints. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing where you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the prophets in the kingdom, but you yourselves are being thrown out. Please, please, people. Jesus is talking to the religious people. He's talking to the believers, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribe. In other words, he's talking to us. And here in the beginning to, to, to the end of this message, I have to share this. Please hear, please hear what I'm getting ready to share. I'm going to share something that could truly challenge your thinking if I haven't already and challenge your theology. And I want you to put on your thinking caps and think, why? Why didn't the Israelites that came out of Egypt, <coughs> they believed, they partook in the Passover, they bake the unleavened bread. They cleanse themselves of unleavened bread. They were there for the first fruits. Why did they, the ones that followed Moses out of Egypt and seen the miracles of God and parted the sea and walked through, why did they, when they covered their doorposts with the blood of the Lamb and delivered, they experienced all of what they experienced? Why? didn't they make it into Canaan? They were believers. Why did they not make it into the promised land? Why did only Joshua and Caleb make it? All of the rest of them believed and did what they were supposed to do. I want you to look at Hebrews with me. 
This, if you didn't hear anything else I've said today, I pray you'll listen to this more than anything else, please. Hebrews chapter 3, starting at verse 15, while it is said, Today if you hear his voice, that's kazon. Proverbs 29, 18, that's kazon. That's when you have the revelation, if you hear his voice. Do not harden your heart. Hardening your heart is casting off the restraints. As when they provoked me, provoking me is continuing on with your foolish behavior after you have received the knowledge of truth. That is changing from just missing the mark to becoming a transgression now that we shared last week. That's where you start challenging God and saying, I don't believe it's true and I'm going to continue down this path until you prove to me that it isn't. Verse 16, for who provoked, challenged him when they had heard? Indeed, was it not those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Who was it that provoked him? It was the believers. And verse 17, and with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those, the believers, who kept sinning, threw off the restraints, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But was it not to those who were disobedient? Now listen close. Why were they disobedient? Why did they throw off the restraints? Verse 19. So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Can you believe believers don't believe? How can you believe be a believer and not believe? Are you catching what's being said? You catching what he's saying? We think that the only disobedient people are those that don't believe in God at all. And yet the writer to the Hebrews is addressing believers. Those that came out of Egypt and did not make it were believers. And he's telling them the same thing Jesus is telling us in Matthew chapter 24. Disobedience to God's standard is unbelief. If you say you love God and hate your brother, you are faithless. You have broken faith, if you're not willing to lay down your life, then you don't believe. Catch what he's saying. Let me explain. If you are an individual that believes in God, that's good, but James says even the demons believe in God. But if you have an offense sitting here this morning in your heart, against someone else and you refuse to forgive them and lay down your life and care about them and get it worked out, then I'm sorry, but you don't believe God. You may believe in God, but you don't believe God's Word. Boy, it's awful quiet. If you are an individual that believes in God, but you're in an immoral relationship out of the bonds of marriage and have an immoral relations, then you don't believe God and God's Word. I know that's hard, but people, we need to start getting straight with God. Amen? If you are an individual that believes in God and you're lying, if you're stealing If you're cheating, if you're gossiping, if you're causing division, if you're being cliquish, if you're not supporting and paying your tithe to God, if you're not separating yourself from the world, if you're not offering your body as a living sacrifice, if you're not offering the fruit of your lips as praise unto God, then you don't believe 
in God's Word. You believe in God, but you don't believe God. They have set their heart on something else. And that's what Paul's trying to tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to grasp this. Romans chapter 4, and I, I, I will be finished in the next two days. Remember, you're not on a schedule. Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, and I am getting down to the bottom, I promise. For what does the Scripture say? It doesn't say Abraham believed in God. It said Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. You see, there's a big difference between believing in God and actually believing God and what God says, what His Word says. A person can believe in God because James says the demons believe in God and still not believe God's Word and it be shown by their actions. Again, I've already mentioned this. James chapter 2, verse 19 through 24. You believe there is a God? Good, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without obedience is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works because he was obedient? Here's McConnell's unauthorized thrown in there. Because he was obedient when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. You see, his faith was working with his obedience. And as a result, the works or the obedience, his faith then was completed. You see, there's two aspects to faith. There's not only believing, but there's obedience and doing what you believe. Verse 23, And the Scripture was fulfilled. It said, Abraham believed God. Not believed in God. Believed what God said. And it was reckoned or counted to him as righteous, doing what was right. And he was called a friend to God. Because you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith. Well, in other words, if you really believe, you're going to be obedient to what God says. And in the parables, the virgins, the stewards, the servants, it's all about them believing in God, but not believing God. Therefore, they were not ready, and they couldn't enter into his rest. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 through 11, there remains a Sabbath day rest for the people, for the one who entered his rest has himself rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent, to enter the rest so that no one will fall, though following the example of the disobedience. And that word rest is New Testament 4520, which means to repose, to lie down, to cease from your labor. It is a picture of being taken to heaven in the rapture. There remains a, re a Sabbath day rest. The believing unbelievers of Egypt could not enter the rest of God couldn't enter the promised land. You and I are warned time and time again not to fall short of entering, not to fall short of the standard. And the standard is love. Love God with all of your heart. Love your neighbor. We are warned not to fall, not to come short, not to fall into unbelief, not to begin to provoke and challenge God, not to throw off the restraints, but to draw close enough to keep that vision and that revelation. And a major key is to believe God, not just believe in God. People, that is so important for you and I to grasp. And this is the last scripture I want to read. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Know this, First of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. The evil steward, you remember the one with the bad character, the evil steward, the five foolish virgins, the man at the wedding with the wrong dress apparel, all lost their vision, their console, their cazone. They all threw off the restraints, and in so doing, they became mockers and scoffers by their actions. 
They lost sight of and don't believe the promise that he is coming and coming soon. And as a result, the garments are being spotted. They're being soiled. And they are carelessly living in their behavior. And consequently, they may not be ready and will miss his coming. The last thing I'd like to leave you with. How many of you have ever thought that you might be classified as a mocker and a scoffer? Amen? You believe in God. But yet, do you know how you can mock and scoff? It's because you don't have a vision of the fact of the reality that He may be coming soon. And it may be around the corner. And you're not forgiving people. You're not getting fences worked out. You're not caring in your reactions and your behavior if it's offending someone else. You're not paying attention to your behavior, your activities. And in the fact that you're not doing that, your character has begun to slip just a little bit and the whittling process of the enemy has begun to take away all of the essentials that make you Christ-like and you have become nothing more than a form. And in the aspect of becoming a form, the reason you've thrown off the restraints is because you really do not believe he's coming. And if you don't believe he's coming, you have become a scoffer and a mocker. People hear what God is saying to the church. He is doing his dead level best. He has got signs all around us. Everywhere we turn, we see things that are happening, things that are on the horizon, things that we know is just around the corner. God is doing everything out of His love and long-suffering and compassion, His gentleness, His mercy, and His grace, and His love to let us know He is coming soon. Get your life ready. Be prepared. And if you believe God and His Word is true, then you're going to be being obedient and doing what it says. And if it says to forgive, you're going to forgive. If it says to tithe, you're going to tithe. If it says to praise, you're going to praise. If it says to testify, you're going to testify. Amen? If it tells you to be faithful, you're going to be faithful. If it tells you to love, you're going to love. People are you doing what God has asked you to do? Would you bow your head in prayer this morning? Lord, as we stand, as we set before you, Lord, I pray that we grasp and understand that our love for you, the standard that you set through Christ was love. The Lord your God first and foremost, with all your heart, soul, and mind. To bring honor and dignity to your name, to receive honor and dignity for us from you. But Lord, the second part is to love our neighbor as ourself and to be concerned about them, recognizing that they too are part of the body. This morning, Lord, I ask that each one of us individually would recognize that our love for you will be shown and be motivated by our love for others. The way we empty ourselves of self, the way we are willing to correct issues and make things right and to do it quickly and not hold off because we have such a love for God, we want to do what your word said. Help us to see and know that those that came out of Egypt were believers. They participated in the Passover. They participated in putting the blood over the doorpost of their heart. They participated in walking through. In fact, you tell us in 1 Corinthians 10 that they all were under the cloud. They were all baptized into the sea. They all had the, the same drink and the same food, and that was Christ Jesus the cloud followed them at night. The pillar of fire was there with them. And Father, I pray that we would begin to see and understand that you've been through uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, 10, even up into 11 to show us and to share with us how we need to lay down our life. And if we're not, we're, we, we're, we've broken faith. And this morning I pray, Master, with all heads bowed,
that our hearts would be moved by your spirit. If you're here this morning, first of all, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't delay. Don't take a chance that he might be another six, seven, eight months, another two, three years. If you don't know him, you've never invited him into your heart, raise your hand and say, Pastor, I really want to know a little bit more about this, how to accept and how to respond, how to ask him into my heart. If you're here and you need that, slip up your hand. We're going to have someone talk with you. Pastor Steve will minister to you. He'll talk to you. He'll explain anything you need. If there's anybody at all that needs to slip up their hand, please do so. The second thing, people, listen to me, and you don't need to look. Just keep your head bowed, but just pay attention. If you're here, there's a difference between believing in God and believing God. If you're sitting here this morning and you have something that you need to correct, you have an issue that you need to take care of, if you believe God's word is true, because he said, if you do not forgive, I cannot forgive you. We can't be involved in the unmerciful servant aspect. We have to be ready to be willing to go to one another and ask forgiveness and get things corrected and taken care of. We have to be humbled and empty in our heart. If you're here this morning and God has been challenging you to stop relationships that you're involved in or to make those relationships that you're involved in a little bit more godly, you need to start doing it. We don't need to hold off. And right now, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand. I'm not going to ask anybody to get up and walk across the room. I'm not going to ask anybody to come to the altars right now. But I'm saying, if you need to get your heart right with God, you need to do it right now. And I'm going to ask Sister Marjorie just to play on the piano for just a moment. And then I'm going to ask you to take that time and let God speak to you. And if there's something you need to correct before you leave, correct it before you leave. If it's as soon as you get out of here, you need to go somewhere, you need to do something, you do it. Take just a few moments, please.